Okay, we will begin recording now. And again, my name is Savannah Haverfield, and I'm the Community Relations Representative here at University Health Issaquah. Our speaker today is Pamela Dean. She is a board certified clinical neuropsychologist at the Puget Sound VA Hospital, Seattle Division, and an acting assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Washington. She received her doctorate in clinical psychology from Gallaudet University and completed a two-year postdoctoral fellowship in clinical neuropsychology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Pamela. Hello and good morning, everyone. It is my absolute pleasure to be here presenting to you about sleep and the importance of sleep. And I'm going to go ahead and share my PowerPoint now so you can all see that and we'll go here to full slide so everyone can see that so thank you for the lovely welcome and again i am very excited to talk about the importance of sleep and how this impacts brain health sleep is something that maybe eludes some of you something that we all do on a daily basis at least in some way and it has so many very important functions for our brain, for our body, uh, for our mood, and we're gonna be talking about those today. So some of the objectives that I plan to discuss, uh, I'll be giving an overview of how we sleep. How does this process work in our brain? I'll discuss how sleep becomes imbalanced, things that we may experience and may not even be aware of, are, that are that is disrupting our sleep on a daily basis or from time to time. And then I'll provide some brief at-home things that you can do to help support your sleep if it's, if it's been become disrupted. So let's just start off with talking about what is sleep. Sleep is a physiological process and we cycle through these different sleep states throughout the night. And I will show you in a little bit what that actually looks like. Sleep, as I was saying before, is such an important part of our daily routine. And we as humans spend about a third of our day sleeping, or night, hopefully. Uh, the quality of our sleep is essential for our brain health and our body health. And in many ways, it's more important than the quantity or the amount of hours that you sleep. I often hear people say, I sleep eight hours at night, but I'm still tired. Uh, so that's where we really want to focus in on the quality of that time spent sleeping. Sleep is actually a very active process. We often think of it as being passive. We go to sleep, our bodies live, fairly still and then we wake up and it's light out but it's actually a very active process there's a lot going on both in our brain and in our body so sleep helps to support things like learning and memory and i'm going to talk more about this in a little bit it also helps to remove toxins that have built up in our body throughout the day and it affects almost every single body system and tissue in our bodies, from our brains to our metabolism, to our heart health, our lung health, our immune system, as well as supporting things like our mood and our ability to fight off diseases. Excuse me. This is a very busy slide. So I wanna acknowledge that and also take you through what it is that we're looking at. And I wanna spend quite a bit of time on this slide talking about it. Now, sleep is such a complex topic. We could actually spend several months talking about the process of sleep. And we're gonna do this in less than an hour. So just to know that this is really a, an overview of the process and I'm not getting into the details of it. So over here on your right side, if you can see my cursor, we have a picture of the brain. 
you'll see some different words on there like the hypothalamus, this SCN, which is called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. It's kind of a mouthful. We've got other parts of the brain, the pons and the medulla. And there's some other acronyms or things that you see on there. There's also the thalamus up here. So this is our brain and the picture of the brain looks a little bit funny. It's almost as if I turned my head and you were looking in on a profile view at the middle of my brain. This over here is the front. This is the back. And what we're seeing here also is how our brain reacts to things like sun and when it's dark outside, so sunlight or darkness. So sleep-wake cycles, this is regulated both by internal factors, things that are within our body, and external factors, things like the sun or the darkness, the light or the darkness. Over here on the left-hand side, I've got many of those brain terms that I was just showing you on the right picture. And I'm going to spend some time talking about those and how they work. So the suprachiasmatic nucleus, or this SCN that's right over here, this is a cluster of thousands of cells within the hypothalamus, and it, it, it helps our brain's internal clock. It helps us to regulate things like the circadian rhythm. The circadian rhythm helps to manage or regulate things like our core body temperature, different hormone secretions, and it helps with our sleep-wake cycle, and it rotates on a surface of about 24 hours or so. This, uh, the circadian rhythm is what helps us to feel tired at night and also to wake up in the morning without using an alarm clock. If you've ever woken up in the morning before your clock goes off, it's that circadian rhythm telling you it's time to wake up. The sleep-wake homeostasis tracks your need for sleep. It reminds the body of a certain time uh, and it tells you that these, these hormones are building up in your brain and that tells you that your body is ready for sleep. It also helps to regulate the intensity of your sleep or how you're able to move through different sleep cycles. And we'll talk about those stages of sleep in just a bit. This, as the sleep drive intensifies with each hour that you are awake, this helps you to then sleep longer at night and deeper after a period of sleeplessness. So we have all of these different brain regions. They're acting in multi-directional uh, ways. They're receiving inputs from other uh, brain regions and stimuli and outputs as well. So this SCN here, it receives input about light from the eyes. The brain stem, we see at the base of the brain, it communicates with the hypothalamus. And this controls the transitions that we experience between sleep and wake. We have different sleep promoting cells in our brain, in the hypothalamus and the brainstem, and they produce a chemical called GABA. And GABA is kind of like brakes in a car. It helps us to decrease what's going on around us. It helps to decrease the arousal centers. We have the pons and the medulla in the brainstem, which are also playing a role in things like REM sleep and signaling the body to relax when we're sleeping so we're not acting out our dreams when we feel like we're in the midst of something, we're, we're chasing down a car or uh, we're in the middle of uh, Europe walking through and, and whatever it may be. So we want to make sure that our body is suppressed during those aspects of our dream. And we'll talk a little bit more about dreams in a little bit. The thalamus up here, this is a major relay station in the brain for processing things like our senses, but it also helps, uh, but in most stages of sleep, it's actually not active. And the reason for this is so we are able to tune out the external environment, things like noise or light to some extent. But during REM sleep, 
so it's that active period of dreaming. It's thought to be involved in sending our dream content, including things like light and sound, to the cortex up here, which is why our dreams can feel so real, like we're in the middle of that scene. Sleep-wake is also regulated by the buildup of different sleep-inducing substances in the brain. And these chemicals can help to generate that sleep drive or that uh, time that goes, that builds up, that lets us know that it's time for sleep. And I've listed down here, again, some of these different sleep cycle chemicals that are down here on the right-hand side of your screen. All right. So I've spent quite a bit of time kind of outlining the different regions of our brain, um, how they're involved in the sleep cycle. And again, I recognize that this is a very busy slide, but that's because that's reflective of how busy and how complex the process of sleep is. So how does sleep actually look? When we think about sleep, it's in two distinct phases. We have non-REM sleep and REM sleep. When we sleep, we cycle through these different phases in a non-linear or non-straight way several times throughout the night. We have things like, we start with stage one. This is when we're drifting off. We kind of feel a lightness in our body, a floating feeling. We may hear things that are going on around us, some sights or some noises in the background, but we're kind of drifting off into that light stage of sleep. And stage two, we're really starting to detach from the outside world, but we can still be easily awakened with certain noises. Over here on the right side of your screen, this is what the sleep stages look like if you're attached to what an EEG or the monitoring that goes on your brain that shows the brain waves at, during different stages of sleep and wake. So I'll point out over here, we've got what the brain looks like during wake. You can see that those um, movements are very short, they're tight, they're condensed to one another. Uh, and then as we move through the different stages of sleep, you can see those peaks and valleys starting to slow and deepen. And you can see even those changes between stages one and stages two, which are still considered light sleep. Then we move into stage three. Stage three and stage four, these are considered deep sleep or slow wave sleep. And again, looking at this picture over here on the right, we can see the, how it becomes deeper and slower as we're moving into those deeper, slower stages of sleep. This is what we think of as being restful and restorative sleep. When we spend time in stages three and four, when we wake in the morning, that's when we feel that we've had a good restful night of sleep. And then we have REM sleep. This is when we feel like we are dreaming. It's a very active dream. It's a very active sleep. And if we look again at the EEG REM sleep, the waves look much more similar to somebody who is awake because of that actual um, aspect of sleep. REM sleep usually happens within the first 90 minutes of falling asleep. We call it paradoxical sleep because our dreams are very active. Our eyes may be moving, our breath may be more rapid, our heart and blood pressure increases. But the one thing that makes us paradoxical is our bodies aren't moving. So that's why you can feel like you're running really fast in your dream, but there's something kind of odd about it that you can't quite run fast enough. Or if you fall, you never actually hit the ground. So those are aspects of that paradoxical sleep within our muscle movements versus what's going on in our brain. So we, oh, one other thing I wanted to mention about this is as we move through the stages of sleep, we don't necessarily go one, two, three, four, REM, one, two, three, four, REM. We may bounce back and forth throughout the night in different stages of sleep. 
So we may go between one and two and then jump into four or go back to two and then jump into REM and then go back to three. So it can go in different ways throughout the night and it's not necessarily going in a set pattern. The other piece of this to note is that we go in uh, phases throughout the night so that REM cycles repeat throughout the night. And when we dream, we spend about two hours each night dreaming. We can dream in different phases of sleep. In fact, we can have dreams happen in any stage of sleep, but our most vivid dreams happen in REM sleep. We don't know the exact function of what the purpose of dreams are, but we think that it may help to process emotions from the day and also to facilitate consolidation of new things that you've learned during the day. If you've ever heard that term, uh, you've done something and you wanna go sleep on it because you don't know what the answer to the problem is. Well, that's because you're going to go into that sleep, you're going to think about it, uh, and it may help you to solve whatever that problem may be. So, you know, I'm thinking about everything that's going on right now in our world. Things are extremely stressful. And, uh, and I know for myself, I've had dreams reflecting some of the things that have been going on. And it's not uncommon for us to dream about stressful or emotional events that have happened in our day. So that leads me to talking about why do we sleep? What is the purpose of sleep? It has many different functions. It's restorative to our brain and helps regulate our body temperature. It's protective. It helps to remove toxins. It helps us to conserve energy. It helps us to build that energy level back up. And it helps to boost our immune defenses so we can fight off common illnesses and even things that are more significant. It is important for brain health. It helps to promote brain development. And as I said before, consolidating or bringing together information that you've learned during your day. And it may also help support things like memory. And it's also primal. It's got a protective and adaptive function to it. So now we've talked about all the reasons that we want to sleep and how it works and how it functions and how it supports our well-being. So what happens when sleep is chronically disrupted? So if you think back to a time, maybe in your earlier days, in uh, your school days or in college or uh, if you were working a job, you think back to a time where you didn't sleep well and you kind of felt that you weren't functioning on all cylinders, right? So if we're not sleeping well, we feel slowed down, we may have a harder time processing information, we may be more inattentive and distractible, we may have a harder time learning new information and remembering that information, it's harder to do more than one thing at one time and multitask or even think through how to solve a problem. I like to think of it as um, there's like a sticky goop on top of your brain when you're not sleeping well, and it's making your system work really inefficiently. It not only impacts our cognition and makes us feel absent-minded, but it also has impacts to our health. With chronic sleep disruptions, we see increases in blood pressure, and this can contribute to problems that we see with heart health and brain health, the cerebrovascular system and the cardiovascular system. There's an increased likelihood of obesity. There's more difficulty with managing blood sugars for diabetes management. We also can see increases in things like inflammatory markers or inflammation within the body, which contributes to more pain. There's more susceptibility to becoming sick with different illnesses. And not only can it impact those different body systems, but it can also impact our mood. It can contribute to things like depression, anxiety, 
and make it much harder to manage stress. It's actually got kind of a cyclical relationship with things like mood and sleep and pain and cognition. So when you are depressed, it's harder to have efficient quality sleep. Maybe you're sleeping too much, maybe you're not sleeping enough, but the quality of the sleep is also disrupted. This lowers your mood. It contributes to lowering, de uh, more, uh, increasing depression, lowering mood, increasing anxiety, and that also decreases your threshold for pain. So now mood is low, pain is high, sleep is disrupted, and it, con it continues on this cycle as it just continues to spiral. And so sleep gets worse, pain gets worse, mood gets lower, mood gets lower, that increases pain. So it's a very challenging cycle. So what are some common causes of sleep disruptions? How much we sleep when, uh, how much we sleep at night changes with age. But nonetheless, there are still several common things that can disrupt our sleep. As we said before, how we sleep is impacted by our circadian rhythm, by light coming in, by noises, and by other chemical functions. So these are things within our day-to-day -day that we may not even think of. Um, so if there's light in your room at night, this can impact your biological clock. I know I'm guilty of, I don't have a TV in my room, but I do have my phone or my iPad, and I may be on there surfing uh, news stories or connecting with people on social media or even reading work emails, doing some light work in there before I go to sleep. There's been research to show that that lighting impacts your brain waves and can make it more challenging to get into sleep. We also live in the Pacific Northwest where we have early mornings that get bright very early for, I think I was, I saw the sun starting to rise sometime near 5 a.m. this morning. Uh, it stays lit, light out until 10 o'clock at night. And then in the winter months, we see that it can be dark until 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock in the morning. And then again, it gets dark around 4.30 in the afternoon. So the changes of light exposure can throw our body clock off. A lack of light during the day uh, can really throw us off in terms of um, telling us when we need to sleep or too much light during the day can make it hard for us to fall asleep or wake up maybe too early in the morning. COVID has, prov has provided a really interesting change for many people who have been outside the home, uh, working outside the home, volunteering in different things outside the home, or even participating in different activities within your living facility, things that would change your daily routine and your daily structure. So not having daily routine or daily structure makes it hard for the brain to know when it's time for sleep. It doesn't talk to that body clock. As I said before, how mental health plays a significant role in our sleep with our mood and our pain. Physical exercise. Now this is another one that's been a lot more challenging as of late. And this is, I wanna be careful when we say physical exercise, but also physical activity, because physical activity can mean a lot of different things. We think of exercise as really increasing our heart rate and having that cardiovascular health, but we can also have a lot of good physical activity through things like dancing, gardening, even just cleaning the house, uh, taking some nice slow walks around the area and neighborhood or um, building in which you're in. But the physical exercise or physical activity allows our body to become tired or fatigued as the day goes on. If you're napping during the day, this can change your sleep drive. It doesn't allow those chemicals to build up in your brain that tells you it's time for sleep. If you're one that uh, likes to fall asleep with the TV on or have some background noise, 
that actually can still interrupt your brain's ability to get into those deep restorative stages of sleep. Now, we just talked about some common things that disrupt sleep. I think it's helpful to spend a moment and just talk briefly about different sleep disorders as well. Um, many of us may have difficulty occasionally with sleep depending on different circumstances. It may be a few days to a few weeks depending on what's going on. For something to be considered a disorder, there is a threshold that needs to be met, both in the time or duration of the sleep disturbance, as well as the symptoms that are impacting sleep and how it impacts a person functionally. Uh, and when I say functionally, I mean things that are typically outside the home with things like socialization, if you are uh, working or volunteering, things like that. Um, so we have uh, a few that I've listed out here. Uh, again, just for some, uh, some are a bit more common, things like obstructive sleep apnea. This is very, very common as um, older adults, uh, as adults age. We may see things like snoring, gasping, or breath pauses. And these can be captured on a sleep study. We see oxygen rates decline, and this is associated with cognitive and physical health changes. There's been a lot of research that shows how obstructive sleep apnea, when not treated, can impact memory and attention. Uh, obstructive sleep apnea means that there's something obstructing the air pathway of sleep. Maybe it's the tongue or the throat as it collapses as somebody's laying on their back. There's something called central sleep apnea, and this is a disorder of the breathing or the ventilation system, and it's related to something going on in the brain that's signaling the body that it's time to sleep. You can also have a combination of these two things. Uh, insomnia, so this is the difficulty to initiate and maintain sleep. There may be early morning waking uh, without the ability to return to sleep. And this is early morning waking, meaning several hours before one intends to wake up. Narcolepsy, this is an irrepressible need to sleep with or without the body kind of just losing all of muscle tone. And then we can see disorders in the circadian rhythm or uh, disorders in sleep-wake. Restless legs, this is where there's an urge to move the legs while resting, generally getting into either stages one or, one or two in light sleep. We don't tend to see this as much in deeper sleep. And then REM sleep behavior disorder. This is where, as I described before, sleep is paradoxical, our body is more or less paralyzed during our dreams, but this is where the body is not paralyzed. It's a disorder of that system, and people will act their dreams out in a very purposeful way, you know, petting the cat or reaching for a glass of water or putting their keys in their pocket or fighting with somebody in their dream. There's been research that shows that that REM sleep behavior disorder is there's a relationship with some disorders in the brain, some different kinds of dementias. I'm not gonna really get into that because that's outside the scope of this talk, um, but if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them at a later time. Uh, this just shows the, uh, how the sleep-wake cycles look, uh, differences between wakefulness, REM sleep, and then RBD stands for REM behavior sleep disorder. And you can see changes here on the brain waves and the EEG, the EMG, which is me measuring muscles uh, during wakefulness and REM sleep, um, oxygen levels, and then how uh, the heart, the lung functioning is also changing. Sleep disruptions in older adults and cognitive impairment is also important to mention. Um, as, uh, as we get older, as I said, our sleep quality and quantity changes. 
that super chiasmatic nucleus, the SCN, may deteriorate. This changes uh, the release of hormones, things like melatonin, and this can lead to changes in the circadian rhythm. We can also see more time spent in stages one and two, the lighter stages of sleep, and less in the slow wave deep sleep stages three and four. About a third of people over the age of 65 report having some degree of sleep dis disturbance or difficulty. So we just talked about all the importance of sleep. So if there's a disruption beyond that of normal aging, there are adverse impacts to the brain and body health. For patients with things like Alzheimer's disease, there was one study that found that up to 40% have sleep difficulty, which is described as having more fragmented sleep, longer periods uh, spent awake during the night as well. So it's not clear if this is why or if there's another reason at play, but there also tends to be increased sleepiness during the day. The degree of sleep difficulty is often related to the severity of the dementia, but in an inverted U shape. What that means is that people that have moderate stages of dementia are more likely to have uh, more significantly impaired sleep compared to those who have earlier or later stages of dementia. So kind of going like on a U shape like that. So among the stress that caregivers often experience, sleep problems is yet another factor. And this is a significant clinical problem and a major source of stress for caregivers because it impacts their own sleep efficiency and their own health as well. And it, it kind of empties the gas tank for them to be able to provide that care for their loved ones. So now I'd like to spend just a little bit of time talking about how we can improve sleep. We've talked about how sleep gets disrupted. We've talked about how that impacts brain health and body health. So now let's talk about what you can do about it. There's a lot of different approaches that can be used at home. You can either do these on your own or you can do them with help from family or a care partner. The three that I'm gonna talk about today, one is called sleep hygiene. The other are relaxation and stress management strategies. And then finally, the sleep diary. Sleep hygiene is kind of a funny term, uh, but it basically is a way to clean up things that we can manage in our day-to-day -day life. If you think back to that slide that I had all those different common disruptions that can happen in sleep, these are ways to approach and attack those. So things like having a routine, it's really important uh, to try your best to have some degree of routine from the time that you wake up to the time that you go to sleep at night. I'm not saying that every hour of your day needs to be scheduled, but getting up and going to bed at about the same time every day can be really helpful. Taking advantage of cues having to do with light so as I was talking about before, we're in the Pacific Northwest where it's dark in the winter and very bright in the summer. So if it's bright in the summer, using things like dark curtains to make your bedroom dark at night uh, so we don't have those light cues to keep us from falling asleep or waking up too early. Or in the dark winter months, turning on bright lights in the morning and keeping those lights on earlier uh, or into the evening so we're not getting our, our circadian rhythm and our sleep-wake cycles mixed up. Physical activity, as I was saying before, is so important for helping our body to feel fatigued. And this can be done through a variety of different things from just doing something in the house, doing some housework and sweeping or cleaning or making the bed or whatever that may be, taking some walks as possible. Um, as we've 
been quarantined, been not able to leave, there's other things that can be done like YouTube yoga videos, uh, chair yoga, if you have um, some limited mobility. Uh, there's lots of different physical activities that we can participate, on, participate in from the comfort of our own uh, homes. Uh, avoid napping if possible. And that's a really hard one. When we're so tired, all we want to do is take a nap because we just can't stay awake. But if you're somebody that is struggling to have sleep during the night, this is one place where you can try and pull that nap back and try to limit it to 30 minutes if you absolutely have to nap and also try not to do it near sleeping hours. Again, we want to build up those sleep chemicals to help us be able to sleep at night. Lay down when you're tired and ready to go to sleep, not beforehand. Uh, and this is another big one, using your bed only for sleep. I think many of us are guilty of doing um, other things in our bedrooms, uh, eating in our beds or reading, watching TV, uh, surfing on our phones or our iPads. And again, the light from this or those activities, that can confuse our brain and it breaks that connection between what the purpose is of our bed, a place for sleep. So taking those activities to a couch or something outside of the bedroom. Make sure your bedroom is comfortable, having a good adequate temperature, enough blankets if you're somebody who tends to get cold, trying to limit drinking fluids too late in the evening, um, because this again contributes to you needing to get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. Some of that is just not avoidable, <clears throat> and I understand that, and there's certain medications that make you more thirsty, uh, but trying to limit fluid as much as possible in the evening. And as I said before, avoiding things like television, smartphones, those, that activity sends a light signal into the eyes, through the brain, and this can confuse our body. I've heard many people say they have a glass of wine to help with sleep. It helps them to kind of relax and get into sleep. Or nowadays, we may also hear people who say that they use marijuana. And while those things may help with somebody initially to get into the early stages of sleep, what research finds is that it doesn't help to sustain sleep. And it can actually have a rebound effect, particularly alcohol, where people wake up and are not able to then get back to sleep and have those restorative stages of sleep. So it can actually interfere and be more hurtful to sleep in the long run. Uh, people who smoke often uh, tend to sleep lighter and have decreased REM, and people who are heavy smokers may also wake up after a few hours due to feelings of nicotine withdrawal. Uh, another one is caffeine. Some people are very sensitive to caffeine and you know, limiting that in the morning is really important, not having any caffeine as the day goes on. And caffeine is something that can be found in things more than just coffee. So being aware of that if you're having some sleep problems. Other strategies include things like relaxation and managing stress. There's activities such as deep breathing, visualization, mindfulness, there's yoga and meditation. It can be really helpful to develop a pre-bedtime routine, something that helps you to unwind, it prepares your body and your brain that it's going to be getting ready for sleep. You have a wind down before bedtime. To do this, you can identify different activities that help you to relax, maybe relieve some of that daytime stress. Practicing mindfulness. Mindfulness is a practice of being here in the present and the now, not thinking back to what did I do this morning? What do I need to do tomorrow? There's, um, there's um, YouTubes that are available to help teach how to practice mindfulness. You can take a warm bath or listen to calm music, not some heavy metal or anything like that practice some meditation or prayer, whatever may help you to kind of calm and center your body. 
This is just an example here of a sitting meditation. I'm not going to take you through it fully. You'll have these slides. You can read through them. But it just gives you an idea of what it could look like. So getting into a comfortable seated position, focusing in on your breath, and this really takes you through the process of how to do that. Um, what you're experiencing, um, how you're experiencing things, acknowledging that your mind is going to wander, and, and that's okay. Um, but then how do you bring it back to the here and now? Uh, and then gently returning your attention back over to your breath and how you continue to do this process. This here is taking you through a type of breathing called diaphragmatic breathing. Diaphragmatic breathing has been shown through research to be extremely helpful with things like sleep and pain and mood. Um, so what this is, is most of us, when we breathe, we breathe through our chest. Our chest rises and falls. But if you look at a baby breathing, and, and you notice the difference in their chest and their stomach, you'll see that it's actually their stomach that's rising. And that's because they're engaging in diaphragmatic breathing. As we get older, we learn the wrong way to breathe. We learn to breathe through our chest. So this is a way to retrain that process. It starts with you, uh, again, laying down in a reclined position, but you can also do this while sitting up. Uh, so if it's uncomfortable for you to lay down, you can do this while sitting up. And you take one hand on your chest and another hand on your belly. And you look at that hand as you're breathing. And the goal is to make your breath uh, and your stomach uh, increase in size while your chest does not move. And then as you breathe out, you see your, um, you see your belly come back in. So you breathe out your chest, your, excuse me, your belly button goes out. As you breathe in, you watch it come back in. So that is the, the point of diaphragmatic breathing. As with any technique, it takes practice. So going through and learning how to do it, maybe having somebody take a look at you as you're practicing it and letting you know if they see your chest rising versus your belly rising, uh, and then continuing to do this. And then you can do this as you're trying to settle in for sleep at night. Um, I'm not gonna go over this slide because I basically just talked about it in the last one, uh, but it's how to do the diaphragmatic breathing. And the last thing I wanted to cover is a sleep diary. So even if we think we know how we're sleeping and our sleep patterns, if we're struggling, to sleep, it may be helpful to have a sleep diary. So you can choose a period that is fairly typical for you in terms of sleep, and then just jot down and record what your sleep has been like when you wake up in the morning. And this helps you to maybe identify where sleep is not working for you. So this is just an estimate of your sleep over the past 24 hours. It doesn't need to be recorded exactly. Uh, it doesn't need to be recorded the minute you wake up. It's really a reflection of what's gone on. And this is just an example of what that looks like. So taking you through some very pointed questions that can help you to identify where you may be having difficulty with your sleep. So what time did you get up from bed this morning? What time did you go to sleep? How long did it take for you to fall asleep? It says in their minutes. Now you're not gonna be looking at the clock trying to estimate this because that's gonna get in the way of your sleep. But you can say if you felt like you fell asleep rather quickly or if it felt like it took you a long time. Or maybe you were tossing and turning and you happened to look over at the clock and now it was 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock and maybe 12 o'clock is the last thing you remember, you can put that in there. But just an estimate of either falling asleep quickly or a long time and if you happen to see the clock. How many times did you wake up during the night? This can be everything from getting up fully to use the restroom to tossing and turning throughout the night. Many of us look at our clocks when we happen to toss and turn and we see that Again, just kind of taking note of it. 
How long were you awake during the night? Again, this is an estimate. If you got up in the night to go to the restroom or you were tossing and turning for a period of time, were you able to fall back to sleep quickly or did it take you a while? How long did you sleep altogether? So just a rough estimate of, I went to sleep around eight o'clock, I fell asleep fairly quickly, I woke up at six o'clock this morning, okay, so I slept for roughly 10 hours. And was that good quality sleep? Do you feel good and refreshed or still tired? Did you drink alcohol the night before going to sleep? And if you did, how much? Did you take any sleep aids? How are you feeling this morning and how enjoyable was your sleep? So tracking this for a week or two can be really helpful. And if you're really struggling with your sleep, you can take this to your doctor and try to talk about some different things that might be helpful. So just some last minute follow-up resources. Um, there's, uh, you can consult with your regular providers. If you have a psychiatrist or a psychologist, you can talk about sleep difficulties. If you don't, you can talk with your primary care doctor. There's different therapies that are out there to help manage chronic sleep disturbance. There's both a talk therapy that's been very helpful for behavioral changes, those things that we've been going through, um, different ways to take you through relaxation therapy or something called cognitive behavioral therapy for or sleep or insomnia. And as I said, always talk with your physician before considering any kind of pharmacological uh, or medication or sleep aid or over-the-counter sleep aid. You want to make sure that something is not getting in the way of something that you may be already taking or something that could be um, not good for your overall health. So just in brief summary, and then we'll get to some questions if there are any. Um, sleep is important for your brain and body health. There are environmental and mental health factors that can disrupt your sleep and identifying and working on these with a mental health care provider or your primary care doctor can be really helpful. Sleep disruptions can lead to impacts on both your thinking or cognition and your physical health. Sleep disruptions can affect people with mild cognitive impairment or dementia and contribute to increased caregiver stress and burden, um, both because caregivers are not getting their own sleep as well as helping to manage the sleep disturbance in their loved one. Practicing good sleep hygiene can help improve the onset and quality of sleep, things like meditation, diaphragmatic breathing, or keeping a sleep diary. Uh, and then again, consult with your physician if you need to learn more. And that is the end of our presentation. And if there's any questions, I am happy to take them at this time. Thank you so much, Pamela. We'll hang on just a couple of minutes and see if some of those questions come into the chat. Excellent. And just remember, if you do have any questions, the chat feature is the third icon from the right in the bottom of your screen. So go ahead and click on that and you can start typing your question. As some people are perhaps thinking about their questions, I will point out that that is my adorable dog, Bodhi. I actually took that just the other night as he was sleeping. All right, Pamela, we do have one question coming in, and it is, how do you feel about melatonin as a sleep aid? So any kind of medication questions, and again, this is, this is uh, I consider it a medication. Um, you should talk about it with your doctor, even though you can get it over the counter, um, because you just want to make sure that, again, that, this, that you, the person who knows you well and the person that treats you for your whatever um, you know, health conditions you may have or other medications you may be on, that there's not going to be anything negative with it. Um, overall, it can be very helpful for people who are struggling to get into those um, stages of sleep. Uh, remember, we were talking about earlier how melatonin is released from the brain and helps to stimulate that process of sleep. And so for somebody who may need a boost of it, it can be helpful. Um, but again, I urge you to take a look uh, at different things that may be uh, disrupting your sleep first 
And if there's a way that you can do any of those behavioral changes first before adding um, medication or hormones to your regimen. And then if that's not helpful, then speaking with your doctor about it. All right. Well, thank you so much for that great answer. I, I don't see any more questions coming in quite yet, but feel free to, oh, there, there's one more question coming in, actually. And can sleep aids be addictive? So oh, that's a good one. It really depends on what it is. Um, there are sleep medications and there are sleep aids. There's things that are over the counter and then there's things that can be prescribed. Um, it really depends on what the substance is and, and what it is. What I will say about sleep aids, again, there's many different things that are out there from homeopathic remedies to other things that can be um, chemical based. Um, they can uh, disrupt the ability to get into the deeper restorative stages of sleep. So again, this is where it's a really good conversation to have with your physician about the pros and cons about using a sleep aid. There are some sleep medications out there that are known to be a bit more um, addictive, if you will. Um, it's good to be aware of that uh, and use a sleep aid for a short time if you're in the middle of having a problem, but continuing to see if there are behavioral strategies or things that need to be um, addressed that can help with sleep so you're not using them for long periods of time. Oftentimes, it may be things that you know, people are not even aware of about how mood, as I said before, that's a really big one, how mood can impact sleep. And by addressing that, uh, there may not need, be the need for additional medications. But yes, some, uh, some can have addictive properties, um, but not all. We had a couple more questions come in. The next one is, uh, is there any data on how shaping of a mattress, uh, or how the shaping of a mattress on sleep? An example is a zero gravity shape. I'm not familiar with what a zero gravity shape is. I'm not familiar with a lot of data on mattress shape, but I am familiar with sleep posture. Uh, so we hear people that oftentimes say they can't sleep in their bed because of pain, and so they will sleep in their recliner uh, instead of their bed. Um, and that does disrupt, again, the, the typical way that our body experiences sleep. And many of these people who have talked about using recliners for sleep are experiencing other things that are also getting in the way of their sleep efficiency. So it's a, it's a pretty complicated question. I'm not sure of anything specific to, um, to, to different mattress types, though, if that's answering the question appropriately. And the next question is, uh, someone is wearing a Fitbit to help track their sleep during the night. And theirs is saying that most of the sleep is light sleep at about 61%. Is that okay or normal? That's a great question. Um, sleep trackers on uh, smartwatches can be helpful and not. Um, so we do use sleep trackers uh, for research. Um, they can help to provide in good information. I would say, I would, I would put the question back on you and say, do you feel rested in the morning? If you feel rested in the morning and you're not tired when you wake up or need a nap within an hour or two of waking up, then your sleep efficiency is probably pretty good. Um, if your sleep tracker is matching up with what you're feeling, you're feeling fatigued, you're not feeling rested, then there is something in there and a place for you to intervene. They're not 100%. I, I think I sleep pretty well at night. I may wake up a couple times in the night for turning over, going to the restroom or whatever it may be. My Apple Watch is constantly telling me that I'm not sleeping. Um, so I've chosen just to you know, pass that off because I feel pretty good uh, and my energy is good and I feel like I'm sleeping well. Um, if my experience was to align with my Apple Watch, then I would take a look and see what's going on. 
Okay. And then it looks like we have three more questions, which will probably bring us to right about time. And then if anybody does have questions uh, beyond this, please feel free to email them to either to myself or I will be giving you Pamela's contact and you can reach out to her as well. Uh, but the next question is, my dad has post-operative delirium and sometimes has hallucinations, especially when he is really tired. How is delirium and sleep related? That's a really good question. Um, so hallucinations during uh, delirium is not uncommon. We can see the sleep cycle very disrupted during delirium. Delirium is almost like um, all the circuits are kind of getting uh, mismatched and there's also that cloud on top so the brain's not working efficient, efficiently. People can have what's called sundowning where they get very confused as, uh, as the day, as the night comes on, that's when they're more awake and more agitated. And we can see that more with delirium. Um, hopefully through appropriate medication management um, and environmental supports that will be able to resolve over time. Um, we do see that older adults take a lot longer to clear from delirium than somebody who's potentially younger. And even though they may uh, have all their blood values maybe more um, normalized, it can still be uh, metabolically in the system for quite some time for older adults. And the next question is, I have been diagnosed as having sleep apnea, but could not tolerate a breathing machine. Are there any other suggestions? Yes, yeah, so there's a lot of really good stuff now on the market. Um, there's, there's different types of breathing machines and CPAPs that are out there and, and BiPAPs. Um, so definitely talk with uh, your sleep medicine provider and see what else may be available. Um, there's uh, uh, also something called, um, there's a type of cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, which is a brief intervention, uh, and it can help with the desensitization of that CPAP. It is very, very common that we hear patients uh, say that they struggle with uh, the feelings, feeling suffocated, it's uncomfortable, um, and all the different things. That, and if you've got PTSD, that may be exacerbating it even more. But there are different behavioral strategies that are available in working with a mental health provider that can be uh, very, very helpful. Uh, we, as I said before, not using a CPAP, we see direct impacts to the brain particularly parts of the brain that are uh, important for learning and memory because of uh, this one little piece called the hippocampus that's in our brain that we know is so important for learning. Um, and it's when it's sensitive to oxygen deprivation, which is what happens with sleep apnea. So we often see patients who say they're, they're absent-minded, they're forgetful, they're really concerned about their cognition. And once they are able to work through that discomfort with the CPAP, they notice almost immediate improvements in their cognitive clarity. So keep on it, keep talking with your sleep providers about different types of masks that may be available for you, and then also see about maybe doing some brief um, behavioral interventions to help with the desensitization and getting used to it. And then our last question is, what is the best position to sleep in? Um, in a bed, number one. Um, if you're asking about on your back or on your side, I'm not aware if there's, or on your stomach, I'm not aware of any, um, anything in particular that says one way is better than the other. I know that there's different things you can Google if you're a back sleeper, if you're a slide sleeper, and what this means. I would say any position in your bed that you're able to get into that is generally comfortable is probably the best way for you to sleep. Great. Thank you so much, Pamela. We really appreciate your time and all this wonderful information that you've shared with us. And I will be emailing all of you a copy of these slides so that you can review them again, along with Pamela's contact information. And then we will also be including a uh, survey sheet that we would love for you to fill out. We want to hear from you what worked well, what could we improve on, and just your overall thoughts of the experience. Um, and then if you would also like to get in contact with us here at University Health Issaquah, you can either reply to the email that I will be sending to you shortly, or you can reach us by phone. And our phone number here is 425-557-4200.
And thank you all so much for attending our webinar today. Thank you very much for having me today.